Imagine having a heart attack and a stroke and being told there was nothing more doctors could do. In my case, uh, 10 years ago, uh, I would be having to prepare for death. Uh, that was, would be the only viable option for me. Now imagine you're a young man. You're faced with the prospect of a second open heart surgery that would take away your ability to do the one thing you love. It was kind of scary to hear that, you know, you're going to do mechanical valve, you're not going to be able to play uh, contact sports. And it's not just soccer, I mean, I like playing basketball and, and other sports as well where there's some contact. You know, right now I'm still 32 years old, I should be active, I should be playing sports. For both men, their best chance is a procedure doctors call TAVR, or transcatheter aortic valve replacement. It will give them the new valves they need without a single chest incision. So I think that's kind of how we're working at Ford, the spirit of innovation. Patients kind of get sent to us with uh, incurable problems and we have to try to find solutions. It's the future of heart valve replacement and it's being pioneered right here in Detroit. But will it be enough to save both men's lives? Welcome to Minds of Medicine. I'm Paul W. Smith. Our hearts are incredibly complex organs. To keep us healthy, they must beat in perfect rhythm, pumping over 500,000 gallons of blood throughout our body each year. The valves that keep this blood moving also must seal and open effectively to keep us feeling healthy and energetic. Even a small leak around these valves can put our lives at risk. There are numerous ways that people develop valve problems. Some people are born with them. Others have infections of the heart that lead to valve problems later in life. And in other circumstances, it's just a normal part of aging. There are just simply patients who would not benefit from the intervention because of their lack of ability to undergo a surgical approach. Now, Dr. Adam Greenbaum and the team at the center of some of the country's most promising heart discoveries is innovating once again. They're offering new life-saving options to the patients who need them most. In the last uh, year or two, I've, uh, it's harder to, to do exercising. I used to, uh, in the summertime especially, ride my bicycle and go on hikes with my wife, uh, uh, take some short trips. And that's been more and more restrictive, especially in the last year. This past year, I haven't been able to do any of that. and. Uh, it was clear to me that my heart just was not functioning uh, at a level that I was happy with and uh, that I was developing more and more uh, health problems as a result of it. After exhausting every possibility, Lou Milichko turned to the Center for Structural Heart Disease at Henry Ford Hospital and the man who launched this new field of heart valve repair, Dr. William O'Neill. Well, Lou has been uh, cared for here in the Henry Ford system for a number of years. He's had chronic problems with his heart, uh, but last summer uh, he presented with congestive heart failure. His lungs were filling with fluid and uh, non-invasive studies and echo showed that his heart was very weak. It wasn't contracting very well. So he was seen by our heart failure service and they recognized very quickly that he had a really bad problem a uh, combination of a very weak heart, but also a very damaged aortic valve. And so that's how I first met him. He was in really poor condition, uh, in severe congestive heart failure, fluids, you know, basically filling up his lungs and in dire straits. It was not a good long-term prognosis. Within a year or two, uh, my heart would continue to enlarge, would weaken further, and ultimately I would die. Uh, that was the future facing me. I'm only 67 years old, only, and uh, I wasn't ready to uh, uh, face the prospect of dying within a year or two and being uh, in poorer health every step of the way uh, uh, till that uh, development of death. They said uh, 
the blockages uh, and the deterioration of the aortic valve are at the point now where we have to do something to take care of that. And with the valves, that meant replacing the, the aortic valve. Uh, traditionally, that's been open heart surgery, uh, where they uh, open your chest and uh, stop your heart and uh, replace the valve on that basis. But they told me that I was not a candidate for open heart surgery. The, the Henry Ford doctors did not want to risk that. But they said that we have a good plan B for you. The procedure to repair Lou's ailing heart involves the use of a small catheter. With it, doctors will move a new collapsible valve through the artery leading to his heart. Once positioned, doctors use a balloon to open the new valve. This pushes the old valve away, and if successful, will allow Lou to return to his active lifestyle. Well, my wife and I like to uh, go up to northern Michigan, Sleeping Bear Dunes, do some hiking, or perhaps uh, take some uh, longer trips out east or out west where I can uh, enjoy a vacation trip and the stresses of being on the road without having to worry about your heart and uh, your body telling you, no, this isn't good for you, uh, slow it down. But uh, just being able to resume normal activities like that, or even just coming uh, to the gym here in Gross Point Park to exercise, or walk out by the pier and watch the freighters in the summertime, uh, those are all experiences that I want to continue to do without uh, having to feel uh, constrained or not feeling up to it. When we come back, we'll learn more about Lou's incredible heart valve replacement and meet one of the youngest patients to ever receive a new heart valve using this approach. At any time, you can go to henryford.com forward slash structural heart and schedule a consultation. Stay with us. Heart problems can strike at any age. Some occur even before birth. And when valve problems threaten the life of 32-year-old Andy Smith, doctors must look for options that can last the patient for decades, not just years. I was born with a bicuspid valve, um, which means I was prone to infection. Um, I was doing twice the work of a regular um, tricuspid valve. And at one point, I had strep throat and got you know through my gums into my um, down in my heart is what they were saying. I was never diagnosed with strep throat. I usually didn't go in to the doctor for sore throats, but at some point I had strep. It ate my heart valve away, and uh, that's what caused the, uh, the first problem. Well, Andy is, uh, is amazing. He's an amazing person, but also a little bit of an unusual circumstance. Uh, he's a young guy, early 30s, uh, was born with a congenitally deformed aortic valve. And so at a young age, in his 20s, he had a surgical valve implanted. And the reason that that was chosen was because uh, the surgical valves that were used, the tissue valves that were used, uh, don't require blood thinners, Coumadin or other medications to keep the blood thin. And he could go back and have a normal life. He was a young guy, he was a soccer player, he was a soccer coach, and he wanted to be able to continue with contact sports. So that worked fine but the valve aged about 10 years after. Uh, these valves tend to last, these tissue valves, uh, tend to last for 10 to 15 years. And uh, once they start to degenerate, then typically um, you have to have another operation to change the valve. And so now you've got a guy that's 32 facing another problem, and he was becoming very symptomatic, so he really couldn't do anything. He was, you know, become an 80-year-old person, and he needed something to be done. Uh, when, the, when the tissue valves start to degenerate, they, they really fall apart quickly. Although Andy could have chosen open-heart surgery and a permanent mechanical valve, he also would have to take blood thinning medication for the rest of his life, eliminating his participation in soccer or any contact sport. Andy's cardiologist in Traverse City recommended that he visit one of the most experienced structural heart teams in the region. So he traveled over 250 miles for his transcatheter aortic valve replacement, a procedure that would allow him to get back to an active lifestyle almost immediately. The procedure took about two hours 
and he was home literally in 23 hours. He was like out of bed that afternoon, up in the chair the next morning and home the next afternoon. So it was almost like, I mean, to me, I, I've been doing heart cats since 1979. The heart cats then would require a two day length to stay in the hospital. We'd do the heart cath, they'd stay overnight, they'd go home the next day. Now we're changing heart valves with the same kind of length of stay that we did you know, with just a regular heart catheterization. So that's just uh, amazing how much the procedure has changed and uh, how um, less invasive it's become. I think the, the main takeaway for this is just how amazing this procedure is. I mean, I was in the hospital having my valve replaced and later that day was fine, able to walk and do things. and. It's just amazing where we're at. They go in through your leg, they come down into your heart, they place it there. It's just, it's really cool what they can do. And I think that is the, the biggest change on my life is just being in awe of what technology and medicine and what they're doing at Henry Ford and all over the place. So it's kind of cool to, to be a part of that. It was just really nice to have the ability to walk and feel better right away. Whereas open heart, you don't have that feeling. Like Andy, Lou Malechko will need a new aortic valve to reverse his quickly deteriorating heart. Weeks earlier, he underwent angioplasty and stent placement to open up clogged blood vessels. Once Lou recovered, the structural heart team at Henry Ford Hospital was ready for a procedure that would change Lou's life. So did you feel much different after we did the valve aplasty and the rotoblader? Have you felt any better? Yes, yes I did. Uh... I was able to resume the treadmill exercising, mm -hmm. but at a reduced pace. I could right. go up to about 3.1 miles an hour to two and a half percent grade mm -hmm. for a half hour. Right. If I tried to go faster, I would start getting the expelling of air yeah. and a weakness in my leg, so I would ratchet it back down to 3.1. You know, what, what happened is that the heart was just wasn't moving at all. And once we open up the blood vessel in the valve class, the heart function has actually improved dramatically. And, um, yeah, but we have to put the new permanent valve in, otherwise the thing will re-narrow and you'll get back to square one. Back to where I was. So this you. is kind of like the optimal time to do this. So the, the procedure, again, to just circle over, you're going to get put to sleep, then we're going to put tubes in both of the blood vessels in your leg. Like both sides. Yeah, yeah, then we're going to put the catheter in and put the valve in. Okay. And when you wake up, you're going to have a new valve. Looking forward right. to that part. Oh, All this right. is a... Uh, new type of valve and uh, it sounds promising. As we've seen here with our structural heart disease program over the past several years has now grown into various other areas, closing defects and uh, what we do now what's really capturing the imagination of many is, uh, is replacing heart valves uh, and that's a, a much bigger advance than just changing the size of the incision uh, from the standpoint of the patient the advantage of having a catheter-based intervention uh, rather than an open heart procedure is not really the absence of the incision, although that's frankly what the patients seem to think most about. It's really the avoidance of the heart-lung machine, uh, stopping the heart, opening the heart, and doing all of the technical aspects of an open heart procedure. In surgery, Dr. O'Neill is joined by cardiac surgeon Dr. Guy Payone along with cardiologists, anesthesiologists, nurses, and radiation technologists, all focused on saving Lou's life. In the transcatheter valve procedure, you're not doing it under vision. You're doing it uh, looking at shadows on a screen, in a sense. Uh, and the most difficult part is, is making sure that the valve is well deployed, because there is no fixing it, particularly, for the most part, after that. Carefully, the valve travels through his aorta to within millimeters of its intended target, directly inside his old valve. In a moment, they will deploy the new valve, crushing the old valve against the heart wall. Okay, I'm coming around the arch now. I'm going around the arch. All right, well, we're going to go to Ken and deploy the valve now. Okay, respirations off, please. Okay, pacer on, please. On. Respirations off. Inject. Inject. That's fine. There. Go ahead, go. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Go all the way. 
Okay, good. Okay. Good, good. Come on, guys. Face her off. As the device is deployed, Lou's fragile heart becomes unstable, keeping the new valve from operating properly. The team will have to make a second attempt at opening the valve using the balloon. They must do all of this while trying to prevent cardiac arrest. What about the paravalvular? I'm going to cross the valve again. We're going to do another inflation, please. Tell me when you're ready. Pacer on, please. Pace her off. Pace her off. Go down. Finally, the valve is placed. Although they will need to watch for leaks in his other valves, Dr. O'Neill can share a moment of satisfaction. Well, we had a little more drama than we hoped for. His blood pressure was very, very unstable, and we were working with uh, Dr. Mike Eisley, our anesthesiologist, uh, to try to kind of support him during the procedure. Uh, he should notice the difference within a week or so. I mean, once he gets out of the hospital, I think he'll notice a big improvement in his shortness of breath. And we're going to keep him in the hospital for a few days just to do some fine tuning. But when he goes home, he should be dramatically better. When we return, we'll follow Lou's recovery and we'll see the 3D technology Dr. O'Neill and his team are using to plan these difficult procedures. We'll be right back. This is a 3D printed cross section of Lou's heart. With models like this one, Dr. O'Neill and his team can plan some of their most challenging cases, creating a safer procedure and improving outcomes. This model was created right here at the Henry Ford Innovation Institute under the direction of Dr. D.D. Wong. My primary role is to do periprocedural imaging planning for these high-risk complex cases that they do from a non-surgical approach. I use uh, imaging modalities like CT, MRI, and echo, ultrasound to get an idea of what your heart looks like inside your body before even going into doing the case. Seeing something that you didn't anticipate is the beauty of 3D printing. Never before, if you think of medicine, has a physician or anybody in the medical field been able to feel a patient's body without ever making a cut on them or opening their body up and causing pain. And the magic of this is I actually have a 3D print in front of me. So this is a patient's anatomy right here, and they have a surgically placed valve in here. We can see this, but 3D is you can feel it now. I can feel how big the top part of the heart is. I can feel how big the lower part of the heart is. But one thing I can do is when I turn this around, I can put my hand in here and look at what valves will look like at certain heights high or low, so I know if I will cut off blood flow to a critical organ. This is when it becomes shocking, and this is how you prevent deaths on the table, and this is where this is really important right now to patient care. We've come uh, initially looking at uh, hearts in two dimensions. We, we have an x-ray, a chest x-ray or, or a cath x-ray, and the, the uh, hearts are not flat, they're, they're circular, they've got different dimensions, and trying to figure out uh, the orientation of one structure to another and sizes is really difficult with the current techniques that we have. And so what we're doing now with the, with the 3D modeling and with the 3D imaging is actually creating uh, exact life-size replicas of structures so that we can go in and examine them and take a look at the orientation and then see exactly how devices would fit, what type of device and how they would fit, whether they would uh, interact with other structures in the heart. Uh, all of that is really, it makes the procedure so much more predictable. There have actually been cases where based on the 3D models, we turned patients down because the risk of what we were gonna be doing was too great or that we didn't have the right size catheter that would fit. So it's, it's, it's refining our ability to uh, correctly uh, guess the correct size and the correct structure that we're gonna be putting in. So it's been an enormously helpful tool. And the fruit of this careful planning is Lou Milechko. Just weeks after his surgery, he returns to visit his cardiologist 
and report back on his recovery. Excellent. Good. You look fantastic. Oh, that's awesome. Not having any shortness of breath or feeling tired. Mm -hmm. This is the best I've felt in a couple of years. Oh, that's awesome. That's so great. So uh, I know when you were first when taking I met care you, of me. Was yeah, it like that? I was having problems. You know, Mr. Malechko has improved significantly. You know, he's active, he's exercising four times a week. Um, he doesn't have any symptoms, and he's happy. You know, he's very happy with the quality of his life. It's amazing, you know. Uh, we didn't have to, he didn't have open heart, so he was very mobile. He went home the next day. Um, he's exercising. Um, so we're very impressed with his recovery. Well, since the valve was inserted in early November, uh, it's been a little over two and a half months now, and I feel extremely uh, good. Uh, my health in all respects is normal as far as I'm concerned. I know I still have uh, cardiovascular disease, and I have to be aware of that in my diet and exercising, but the before and after, I feel so much better. I have more energy. I'm not having the symptoms of shortness of breath. I just feel stronger overall, uh, and I'm very pleased with the outcome. It's given me hope that I still have uh, a number of years, and I feel uh, with this procedure, I can still do things that my wife and I were planning to do and were hoping to do, and I'm really grateful for that uh, opportunity. To me, what's amazing about this field today is that we are coming up with solutions for patients that have problems that we didn't think previously repairable. It gave me the ability to go through a whole change within the heart without having the pain, without having time away from, you know, life. It's, it's really cool. The favorite day of the week for me is uh, in the clinic where we see the people for the one year, for the one month, and then the one year follow-up because they, they really just, just notice a, a miraculous improvement in their quality of life. It's just going from completely bedridden to becoming active. And again, I think you can see both Lou and Andy are good demonstrations of how well people do. I think, and, and all of the, my staff entirely, they all get totally uh, geeked by seeing how well the patients do after the procedure. Your heart's health can impact nearly every aspect of your well-being, so don't put off taking care of it. If you or someone you care about need a second opinion or a heart smart screening, immediate appointments are available. Go to henryford.com forward slash structural heart to learn more. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to watch past episodes of Minds of Medicine at any time, go to henryford.com.